Hi, Nancy. Hello, Shane. So, do you want to play a game? Yeah. I mean, so long as it's a fun game. <laughs> well, okay. It's more of a test. Mm. So, maybe... <laughs> Not really a game. That's <laughs> a really test. Like uh, okay. So, how do you feel about seals? Oh, I love seals. Okay, perfect. How do you feel about sea lions? I like sea lions. Do you know the difference? They bark. Who's they? The sea lions. Don't they bark? Do seals the, bark too? The, well, okay. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, so seals or sea lions. So which ones have ear flaps? Ear flaps. I'm going to go with seals. Which ones have really strong like front flippers? Uh, I'm going to go with sea lions. Sea lions have whiskers. What? Whiskers? <laughs> They do have whiskers. I don't know where that one came from. Uh, which ones can easily walk on land? Oh, um, sea lions. <laughs> I have to note that like Lauren's in the room giving Nancy hints. <laughs> so it's actually a trick question because it depends on the species. Ah. Yeah. So uh, actually a lot of seals and sea lions that most people might be familiar with. Uh, like I work at a zoo part time. And so the sea lions can do some things and the seals can do th some things. But uh, there are some seals that are more closely related to sea lions than actual seals. Is that really cool? That is really cool. And they make a noise like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back to barking. Well, okay. I, I, I think it's really cool. No, it is. Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hamlin. And I'm Nancy Bompey. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. All right. So today uh, we're going to talk with Lauren, who has a story for us. Hi, Lauren. Hey, guys. Hi, Lauren. Hi. <laughs> uh, so what, what do you got for us? So uh, back in February at the Ocean Sciences meeting in Portland, I met these two scientists who study seals. I'm uh, Noel Pelland, and I'm a physical oceanographer and postdoc at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. And uh, I'm Jeremy Sterling, and I'm a fishery biologist with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center studying fur seals and sea lions in Alaska. All right, Lauren. So uh, what are Noel and Jeremy doing? Well, what they do is they actually track northern, northern fur seals off the coast of Alaska. Cool. Why? <laughs> Good question, Nancy. Northern fur seals are actually top predators, which I did not know. So they're really important ecologically, but historically they were really important to the fur trade. When Europeans came to Alaska and the Aleutian Islands in the 17th and 18th centuries, they started hunting seals for their really warm fur. And this is a really lucrative trade. So that's why we've been studying them for a long time and we know a lot about them as a species. That makes sense. Um, but so what do they actually do to study them? So what they do is Jeremy goes up to Alaska and the Aleutian Islands and this small group of islands called the Pribilof Islands, and they put trackers, like little satellite tags, on the fur seals' bodies. So this is like uh, like Garmin for seals or, or GPS or Google Maps, whatever, whatever the reference is, just not Apple Maps. No, not Apple Maps because Apple Maps is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like GPS for seals, basically. And I also I feel I should say that the seals are not hurt in this process at all. That's good. But it can actually be pretty dangerous because they go up there when the seals are breeding and these males are giant. They're about 500 pounds and you really don't want to mess with a 500 pound fur seal when he's trying to get it on. No, you don't. I'm just like picturing like a rodeo with seals. Yeah, that's pretty much what it's like. <laughs> During that period, the males are very aggressive in defending their territories for the, to, to be able to breed with the females. <laughs> And so, but to get access to them, we have to have some protection. You can't just walk in there and, and do the work. We'll go up and uh, we'll, we actually have to get into a protective box. It's essentially a four-walled plywood box, maybe uh, three-eighths inch plywood. It has a door in the front and it's used to protect us from the adult males that are aggressively protecting the territories where the females are, but we want to catch the females and put a tag on them. Think of the Flintstones. Just imagine you're the, fl the Flintstones, it's yabba dabba do, and they get up and they run. It's kind of the same thing with this box. We, we, pick, we have handrails on the side, we pick the box up, and you have three people trying to walk in synchrony over rocks and logs and getting kind of pushed around by males and, 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 and to, 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 to catch, catch the females. 
you're in this little box, this wooden plywood box, and only three eighths of an inch plywood is separating you from these giant 500 pound male fur seals. Is it scary? Like, what's it like for you to do um, that? I think it it's scary only when you have a male that's not behaving as you can as you perceive it will behave. Sometimes you make the wrong decision, and you decide to kind of mess with the wrong guy. And it, typically, what will happen is they just won't budge, uh, and they'll start to push the box back. And then that's when everybody, you know, you don't turn the box around. Everybody just stops turns around and then runs the box back out of the territories. So what was it like the first time you had to do this? That's a funny, that's a funny question, actually. <laughs> I am, um, so the first time I ever did this, I volunteer, I was a volunteer. I was working with uh, Dan Costa at University of California, Santa Cruz. I was a student uh, at the university at that time doing my undergraduate work. And he had a graduate student, Mike Goebel, who'd spent many years working up in the Priblovs on northern fur seals. The first time that I went up there, I got into the box, and that scared me. That was, the, so that was part of his project, the early part of the season. All three of us jumped into this box, and I said, well, we're really going to get in this thing? <laughs> and then as we went into the rookery itself, I just could not believe that we were in and amongst so close you just look over the side and there's there's all the animals and sometimes uh, other males that aren't in the rookeries themselves are very opportunistic and so when we had moved the box this is my first time in the box moved into the colony those males see something different going on that and they're waiting in the in the water and one of them just bolted through to try to establish a territory because there was some, something else going on. It was distracting the other males and came in and decided to set up shop with his back right on next to the box because he didn't have to worry about getting hit by anybody behind him. And literally, I kid you not, fur is flying into the box. And my eyes were probably, I don't know how big. And then Mike just casually turned around and said, okay, let's get out of here. It's, you know, because it was a little bit too busy going on. And, I pulled that box all the way down the hill. <laughs> like I, was, <laughs> I was scared. This, uh, this reminds me of being in hunting blinds when I was younger. So I actually have a pretty funny story about hunting blinds. Okay. Um, yeah, never been in one. I grew up in the total complete suburbs. <laughs> never went hunting. But um, I used to live in North Carolina. I worked for the newspaper. And one day there was a plane crash. So we had to go up to look at the plane that was crashed on the side of this mountain and these guys are taking me up in their you know off-road vehicle and i'm like what's that a tree house <laughs> <laughs> and they were like no <laughs> girl from new york no i probably would have said the same thing i don't know what a hunting blind looks like i've never been hunting yeah i think a, a tree house is probably much more fun for the animals than a, <laughs> than a hunting blind yeah I mean, isn't it basically just a treehouse, though, that you hunt from? Um, it could be in the ground, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, But if kind it's of. in a tree, it's basically a treehouse. Yeah, exactly. All right, a, that's a cool. Dudley treehouse. Yeah, but see, the thing here, Shane, the difference is that in a hunting blind, you're far away from the animals you're hunting. Here, they are getting right up close and personal with these giant 500-pound fur seals. That doesn't sound exciting at all. No, it's pretty terrifying. But the good thing is, is that after breeding season is over, you know, all the males kind of chill out a little bit. And then what the researchers have to do is they crawl into these rookeries, which is just where the male, I mean, sorry, the females have their um, pups. And so they go in there and they try to tag the females and the pups that are that have just been born so it's a little bit safer for them later in the season you crawl in to these rookeries you lay down you sneak in you have an animal that you're choosing to that's part of a study if it's either a pup a juvenile or an adult uh, adult female and um, you have a big net and you're dragging that along the ground and you sneak in and you can get really close to them the distance of us which is about two feet mm -hmm. and you can you know, if you're really lucky and the wind doesn't change and they, and they don't really, they can see you sometimes, but if they don't smell you, you're okay. And if uh -huh. you don't have a lot of contrast, so you're kind of in green gear, you're trying to blend in with the environment. As you're using, you know, beach logs as, can, you know, areas to hide behind and sneak around and to get to the animals that you want to. And then you catch them with a net, a big net, and you get them inside the net. And, um, and there's, when you go in, there's typically two people. 
the other person has just a pole and the pole is used to slide in through the net and so you can pick the animal up and, and walk it out of the rookery. And then you take it to uh, an area, a safe area where we can work. There's a restraint board that we put the animal in and then we can um, take whatever samples we need to take or put whatever uh, technology or satellite tag on the animal and then just release them and let them go. Jeremy told me, as he showed me, I've never been to tag Northern Fur Sales before, but he shows me these really nice sunny videos of them at San Miguel Island, which is the southernmost um, Northern Fur Seal rookery in the United States, and it just looks like a beach party. And so these <laughs> pups are around, and they're these really cute, incredibly um, intricate featured pups that you just want to pet. <coughs> but as we're watching the video, Jeremy's saying, you know, they look cute, no, but they will rip your finger out. Yeah. Give them the chance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. We call them, the nickname is Little Chainsaws. <laughs> so. Has one ever tried to bite your finger off? <laughs> yes. I've lost lots of flesh to little pup, to pups, during, particularly in the fall, because really? at that time, they're, the, particularly with females, their canines have started to already come in, and they uh, can be fairly aggressive at that time of year. Typically, the bigger they are, the less likely they're going to fight. You're not as feisty because they're just so full. You know, they're just... <laughs> they're like they're, fat and happy. We call them butterballs, you know. So with butterballs, I'll never look at turkeys the same way again. I don't care. I don't really like turkey. You don't like turkey? How can no. you not like turkey? What I do you just, do on Thanksgiving? I don't really like poultry. I'll eat a little piece, but that's it. Just to, just to say you did. Yeah. I feel bad for you. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> so back to seals. Uh, this, this is, uh, uh, with the pups, this is fun. This is adorable. But why are they actually doing what they're doing, the scientists? <laughs> well, seal populations have actually been declining for a while, for the, uh, you know, ever since around the mid-20th century, and scientists aren't really sure why. So that's why they go to these rookeries and place the tags on them so that they can track them when they go into the ocean. And they spend almost a year at sea on this long migration. That's where they're foraging for food and they're resting and you know just kind of hanging out in the water. So that's why they want to know where they go, and they're especially interested in where the pups go. Both moms and pups and and adult males are all doing this cycle, and they're doing it in slightly different ways. Um, but it's a really long amount of time spent at sea in a lot of different ecosystems, and big shifts in weather, climate, eddies from year to year could conceivably really impact a lot of individual northern fur seals in their ability to eat, um, how much food they can they can gather. A big thing about the pups is that they they're four months old, they've never migrated before, and they don't get any help from their mom and dad on how to migrate. There's maybe some speculation that they're also starting this migration with a ton of other experienced animals who are just in the water mm -hmm. around them. We also know that as they are starting out, they've never foraged before either. So they, they go in the water and they have a certain amount of fat on their bodies, and before they have exhausted all that fat, they have to learn how to forage or else they'll starve. Right. Um, so it's a very perilous and critical time for them. It's also the weather's really bad, water's getting colder um, with every day that goes by. So um, a lot of things have to go right for them to be able to make it. Adult marine mammals, year to year, they survive at a pretty good rate. You know, generally like for your adults, 90% or more if, that are 13 are gonna make it to 14. But for pups, it's more like you know, it might be 50%, it might be 20%, it might be less, and it might change from year to year. If we can figure out what is causing those year-to-year -year changes, it might give us some insight into what is causing these, these bigger long-term changes in the population, which we don't know if those are because of pup survival or not, but, but we want to find out. I'm just picturing the sad Sarah McLaughlin commercial, but with seal, her holding seal pups instead of puppies. Oh, yeah, that one that comes on, like the public access or whatever oh my it God. is. It's like, yes. It gets me every time. It's like emotional suicide. I, know. I don't even like dogs that much, as you know. But, but that, even that, I'm like, oh my God. Nothing tugs at my heartstrings like that, like that commercial. <laughs> well, oh so, so what's actually causing the pups to die? Well, that, they're not really sure. That's the thing. It could just be bad weather because, you know, imagine being a tiny little seal pup and you're in the ocean oh. that's really cold and the wind's blowing and there's a storm and all that. It's terrible. But so that's what, kind of what Noel's looking at. He's looking at whether the directions that the winds are blowing are affecting where they go and maybe that's affecting, you know, where they can find food and whether they survive or not. 
So for a couple years, they've been looking at that, the tags they placed on these seal pups. Some years, they saw that the pups ended up further to the east, kind of like closer to the coast of, you know, western North America, or some years they end up further south. Um, And what they found is that the directions the winds were blowing actually matched where the pups went. Huh. We found that the the pups, on average, moved um, downwind and to the right. When a wind, a steady wind, blows um, across the surface of the ocean, it, it exerts a drag on the ocean. It's kind of like, like you putting your hand on a sheet of paper and, uh, and moving it along a, a table. But because of the rotation of the earth, the, the currents that are forced by that, that drag, but forced by that hand pushing it along, they aren't straight down the wind in the northern hemisphere, they're downwind and they're a bit to the right as well. So when we saw that, it was kind of the first, one of our first interesting clues that, okay, we're, we're seeing real physical signals here um, in these pups. And so from there, we, we then we kept looking at it in more detail and we found, well, as the winds get stronger, the pups tend to move, um, they move in a more concentrated way uh, downwind. Is that good or bad, or do you know yet? So that, that's kind of the million dollar question behind our research and the, the way that we have to go about that. But short answer, no, we, we, or short answer, we don't know is what I mean to say. And the reason or the, the way that we need to find that out is we need to have some knowledge of the year to year survival of pups. And then we have to be able to compare that to the year to year changes in the wind and what that means for pups. So Shane, you probably know a lot about Alaska because you've been there, right? I've been. I I've only been once, but I love Alaska. I I've go. been to Alaska too. Thanks, you Nancy. have. <laughs> you guys have both been to Alaska. I've never been to Alaska. Oh, Sweet. Well, it's, it's great. You should go. I want to go. I've never been, but I actually kind of learned a lot about a lot about the history of Alaska from talking to these guys. Something interesting that came out of their work is they wanted to see. So they saw that seals kind of travel with the winds, right? They wanted to see if anyone else had ever documented this. So at their lab, they had this huge archive of old papers and memos and things about fur seals, you know, from the past couple centuries because they were so important, you know, to the fur trade. And so nestled within all these papers, they found these discussions about that same thing, whether the weather was affecting where the pups go. From how long ago? Like a couple hundred years, oh, maybe about a hundred or so years, like in the 1800s. Oh, wow. That's so interesting that people have been looking at this like since back then. Yeah, back, you know, when colonists first got, went, got to Alaska and they talked to the native Alaskans about it. So there was, so basically Jeremy was looking through all these papers and he would find one paper that cited another paper and cited another paper and blah, 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 all the way back to like the 1890s. So what happened was, is that the U.S. bought Alaska in 1867, probably with money they got from the seal fur trade. Probably. Yeah. So they own all of Alaska. They own the islands where the fur seals breed in the summertime. And so, but all the other fur traders from the European countries, from Great Britain and Russia and Japan, so they couldn't hunt them on the islands anymore because now it was U.S. territory. But... So they decided they were going to go and hunt them in the open ocean because they didn't want to stop. So when they did this, started going out into the open sea, what happens is they would a lot of the times kill the adult females. They might have been pregnant or might have been nursing pups back on land. So they never came back to the land. No, the the pups would die. It's so terrible, right? Your mom just dies at sea and you never see her again. (laughs) I know, it's terrible. Oh, we're back to Sarah McLaughlin. (laughs) Yeah, we are. Oh, my God. So that was a big problem. So the population just like totally tanked. You know, no one knew what was going on. It had a very, very uh, dramatic effect on the population, which was declining rather rapidly. And there were lots of people on the islands that were witnessing that. What the U.S. response to that was, well, we're going to seize your sealing vessel if you are hunting uh, fur seals uh, pelagically. Well, that was illegal back then to do that because there was no maritime rule saying that you could, that we actually own that resource outside of the island itself. It was the high seas. And, um, and so what ended up happening is uh, the U.S. and Great Britain were in a, there was a court case, a tribunal that occurred in France. And so the reason that all this information uh, was gathered from, or the testimony or the affidavits were taken from uh, the Aleuts and the Aleutians at that time, was to present that information on the U.S. side to the court to make the case that the U.S. owned the species no matter where it was in the ocean, essentially. 
So how does one get testimony from the Aleuts? Good question, Shane. Thank you. So at the time, the Secretary of the Treasury sent this guy, Captain Hooper, and he was a U.S. Revenue Marine, which was the predecessor to the Coast Guard. He's, they sent Captain Hooper to the Aleutian Islands to interview the Aleuts and get their testimony and find out what exactly they knew about fur seals and their migration, because they had been hunting fur seals for thousands of years. Um, so his job was to go and get their testimony to present it as evidence for this for this court case. He interviewed tons of um, Aleut hunters hmm. about what they knew about fur seals, and uh, they told him a lot. At that time, they sent him to the Southern Bering Sea and uh, the Gulf of Alaska with instructions from the Secretary of the Treasury to, among other things, collect affidavits from the locals there regarding um, the behaviors of the Northern First Island. They were really focused on which passes in the Aleutian Island chains that they went through. He had spent a lot of time up in Alaska and uh, in a lot of the different communities, so he was very familiar with it, so mm -hmm. it wasn't anything new. Previously, he was involved in actually seizing British vessels, or he was outfitting camps, mm -hmm. or he was uh, involved in searching for explorers that were up in the Arctic where that didn't return. I think what's interesting about him is that um, his testimony or the, the way that he writes about his experience is that he's very respectful of the various communities that he's, that he's gone into, uh, the people that he was working with. He had uh, translators that were Aleuts, and that seems to come through. Did they have any records of what Knowles found about the winds influencing where the pups end up? Or did they have any knowledge of that? They knew that the winds influenced the direction that they go. If, there was a, if it was really stormy or um, um, a lot of big waves, they wouldn't see the animals. And presumably, what they hypothesized was that they were spending more time underwater or going deeper uh, in the water. But there is the, the general statement that um, the pups go through certain passes and the reasons that they go through those passes are because the prevailing winds blow in this direction. The Aleuts are consistent in saying that the seals travel with the prevailing winds. They will travel with a fair wind. They also um, talked a lot about uh, the different passes and the currents and which passes had really strong currents and which ones were didn't have uh, nearly as strong currents and the pups tended to use, utilize the passes with the where the currents weren't nearly as strong and if you go and look at any uh, physical observations uh, current or uh, re uh, recent history observations their their observations of the passes are exactly what has been quantified and what we see today it's remarkable in looking at the old data and what Hooper collected the real agreement that we do see um, between the life cycle as uh, it was understood then and the way we understand it now. Oh, so what happened with the court case? <laughs> well, shocker, the U.S. lost the case because womp womp. <laughs> the court found, no, you cannot prevent people from hunting seals on the high seas because it's not your territory. Yeah. Um, but the case actually led to this treaty being signed by all these you know, international powers that um, outlawed, eventually outlawed, uh, open water seal hunting, and so um, the population did eventually rebound, which was good for the little seal pups. Oh, that's good news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, In this is. End. I just, I just feel good about this. Like this is, this is a story I needed right now. Even after being sad, now you feel good. Yeah, yeah. So we we've come full circle from like cute, adorable to seals dying to now um, you're no longer no longer able to hunt them. And yeah. They're adorable. Yeah. So cute. All right, folks, that's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks so much to Lauren for bringing us yet another wonderful story. Lovely. And Nolan Jeremy, of course, for sharing their work with us. And the podcast is also produced with help from Josh Spicer, Olivia Ambrosio, and Liza Lester. And thanks to Kayla Suri for producing this episode. We'd love to hear your thoughts on our podcast. Please rate and review us on iTunes and listen to us wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And, of course, thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next time.